Okay, thank you everybody for being patient with me. I thought I got that settled and taken up here. Good to be back with each other and glad to have everybody here tonight. I'm going to continue with our series of lessons on corroborating the Bible. Look at archaeology, history, and the Holy Scriptures and how the archaeology and history can sometimes help us to understand the Scripture better. I can contribute to our understanding of the Scripture. We're going to tonight look at when archaeology goes south. I'm going to just tell you right now, there's only going to be one Bible lesson or one Bible of Scripture tonight. It's going to be the very last slide. The rest of the time, we're just going to look at what happened in history not too long ago concerning archaeology and how folks will use archaeology to try to disprove the Bible rather than to prove the Bible. So now we're going to jump forward about 2,000 years to the times of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, that's from the, from the creation of the world, about 1,000 years from the time of the flood. These events happened about 2,000 years before Jesus was born on the earth. We're also going to look at an example of when archaeology seemed to answer a lot of Bible questions, only to have it stolen away later on. Uh, the lesson uh, that I want you to really take to heart tonight is be very careful when using science to prove or disprove the Bible. Be very, very careful when you, when you do that. Uh, oftentimes, uh, science, science will seem to be supporting scripture, and then they'll flip things around and take away what they said it was support. And so, so be very careful before we start using uh, science and, and such like to, to try to prove the scripture. So now we're going to talk about a series of, of tablets that were discovered, and they're, they're called the Ebla tablets, Ebla tablets. Uh, many of you may remember when these tablets were discovered because they were they made a huge splash in the news media when they when they were found. Uh, it started in 1964, which is the year I was born, by the way. A young graduate of Rome University named Paolo Mathe and his team uncovered a city at what is known as Tel Mardik. I remember that a tell is a man-made hill that covers centuries of remains from an ancient culture. Uh, usually it's, it looks like a, a just a regular hill, but you can tell by the, by the shape of it or whatever that it probably was not a natural. Uh, occurrence and so lots of times they can find a lot of good stuff in these in these hills uh, from ancient cultures. Tel Mardik is located in uh, in uh, northern Syria and so it's a it's a very well-known uh, place now even to this day. The city of Ebla uh, is, is, is what was discovered there. One of the items that was found was a male statue which had a 26 line inscription with the words dedicated to Ibn Ilim, son of, uh, son of Ikris Hepa, king of Ebla. That was found in the city was that found in the city was also a room associated with the king's palace. It seemed to be the library of sorts uh, and, and a, a storage place. Eventually, they unearthed about four thousand clay tablets in, in Abla, uh, which have some bearing on, on the scripture, and we'll see that as we continue on. Um, okay. Yeah. Tablets were inscribed in the cuneiform text, which we've already learned about. The cuneiform text is the, is the wedge-shaped text that uh, was famous with, uh, with Mesopotamia and especially the Sumerian language. Uh, this one was different from the usual Sumerian language, though. And uh, epigrapher Professor Giovanni Pettinato from Rome uh, did the initial translations and deciphered the tablets. He designated the new language as Paleo-Canaanite, a very early form of, of language. The tablets revealed that Ebla was a flourishing empire as early as 2500 BC during the time that Abraham would have been alive and walking on the earth and same with uh, Isaac and Jacob. So the reason that we look at this in, in the time of the, uh, uh, the patriarchs is because the tablets were approximately that old. Uh, they, were, they were being written about the time that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were walking on the face of the earth. Most of the tablets are boring stuff. When I say boring stuff, I just mean they were, they were routine, everyday stuff that we, you would look at from a city uh, that would be uh, concerning the, the, the welfare of the city. Most of the tablets contain routine matters of the running of the large city, uh, most dealt with economic matters, tariffs, receipts for goods, and other commercial matters. There was some cultic stuff, however, dealing with gods such as uh, Sanki, Anlil, Utu, Anana, uh, Tiamat, Marduk, and Nadu. You remember Tiamat and Marduk being the, the earliest gods of the, of the uh, Sumerian uh, pantheon, Tiamat being a large dragon, and so on, and Marduk being the person that defeated Tiamat. So as you look at these, uh, these tablets, some of them had to do with cultic matters. Most of them are just routine stuff for, for running of the city. But, the, but as, a, as a, uh, the, the epigrapher was, was translating some of the tablets, he said that some of them held place names that were familiar in the Bible. Though often denied by modern scientists today, uh, he said at that time that they were familiar names from the Bible. He found names such as Ashdod and Sidon, Hazor, Lachish, Megiddo, uh, Gaza, Sinai, and Joppa. And he said that he found those names in the documents and places. Perhaps the most sensational was a claim that a tablet contained the names of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and, Ze and Zoar, for all the cities of the plains destroyed by God with fire and brimstone in the Bible. Scientists have long claimed that the Sodom and Gomorrah story was a complete myth and, and a fabrication. 
that never happened. And they, they, they have always said that there was no such place as Sodom or Gomorrah uh, prior to the, the, the writing of the scripture. So um, we're going to see that if the, if the tablets were proven to be true and they did have Sodom and Gomorrah in there, that's good, that's good uh, evidence that, that Sodom and Gomorrah existed when God said they did, when the Bible says they did, and that God destroyed them like, like Satan did. Uh, you, can, you can understand that why there would be a real media flurry when they said such things were discovered. Such amazing finds created an, an immediate media frenzy. All major newspapers and magazines and other publications began posting stories touting the amazing finds that gave so much support to the Bible stories. Uh, you can imagine if, if after decades of uh, folks saying that these stories were not true, uh, these places never existed, then all of a sudden you find some tablets that have the names, that would, that would create quite a media flurry uh, uh, as well. Uh, so, so certainly the media got involved in it and began to post all kinds of stuff, some of which was not very well researched and some of which was absolutely untrue, uh, but they, they did it anyway. And then politics stepped in, and that's where we want to start uh, looking at how, how politics can, can alter what people believe about scripture, what people believe about the Bible. With the information seemingly supporting the Bible account, Syrian government officials stepped in and tried to get a better clarification of the amazing finds. Now, why would, why would Syria be interested in this? Well, Syria was constantly at war at that time. It still is to this day, I, I suppose, with, with Israel. And there was, there was very high tensions between the two over who owned what and where uh, in, in, that, uh, in the Middle Eastern world. At stake was hundreds of years of fighting between Syria and Israel. Statements were made about the discovery linking the new language to a form of Hebrew. Uh, the epigrapher said that, that the, the, the language was very similar in some ways to Hebrew, suggests that the early inhabitants of Babylon might have been Hebrew. Uh, Syria, Syria responded with this uh, statement, Mr. Begin, that being Menachem Begin, for those of you who remember Menachem Begin, Mr. Begin was trying to use the Holy Bible as a real estate register. Today he wants the West Bank, in a few years, maybe Aleppo or Damascus. They were afraid that if he could prove that, that these folks were early Hebrews, he would have more of a claim over, over Syria uh, than, he, than he presently had. Uh, and, and so they were very afraid that that would take place. So they began to ramp up their, their, uh, their efforts to try to change the story a little bit. And that resulted in a, in a series of retractions and retreats uh, almost immediately. Uh, Pedinato, the, the epigrapher, and Mathiah, the, the guy who discovered the stuff in the first place, they began retracting their information or, or changing their information somewhat. Next, Pedinato and Mathiah had a falling out resulting in Pedinato being replaced by Alfonso Archi of the uh, University of Rome as, a, as the epigrapher for the tablets. So you see the original guy, the Pedinato, who said that they found these, these names in there, is now replaced by a guy named Alfonso Archi. And, and so he, he begins to reinterpret the earlier interpretations, which resulted in practically every one of those references supporting the Bible text being removed. Things went from Bible boon to Bible boondoggle. All of a sudden, nothing supported the Bible and nothing supported scripture. It's just a bunch of other stuff. So who was right? Was, was Pedinato right or was, or was Archie right? And can we figure that out? Well, at the same time that all this is going on, uh, the Bible, the Biblical Archaeology Review, which is probably the premier publication for tracking archaeology and its effects on the Bible scholarship, uh, steps into the story and they begin to, to run a series of stories trying to get to the heart of all the matter. They immediately got involved in the story and tried to make sense of it all. Uh, from, but uh, I, I've, never, I've never subscribed before, but I'm now a subscriber to Biblical, Arche to Biblical Archaeology Review because now I need to know some of this stuff and figure out where it all went to. Uh, so this week I, I subscribed and did a lot of research in their, in their archives to find the stories that dealt with the, uh, with the Abel tablets. I found a story in 1979 by Herschel Shanks, uh, who said, it is now clear that anti-Zionist political pressures in Syria are attempting to affect the scholarly interpretation of the Abel tablets. Pedinato, the original epigrapher, began distancing himself from the other day claims, blaming the news media for blowing things out of proportion, which I can believe easily happened. But certainly he started to change his story again and said that uh, the media had blown some things out of proportion. And then it all went away by December of 1979. Even the BAR uh, published an article entitled Ebla Evidence Evaporates. Uh, the original claim that the five cities of the planet were listed in the same order as scripture was supported by Father Ma Ma Mitchell Dehud, a professor of Ugaritic and Phoenician, uh, Phoenician languages uh, who worked with, uh, with uh, uh, Pedinato on the earlier tablets. As Dehud uh, said, what he saw, he saw all the five cities in the same on the same tablet. So he saw all the five cities on the same tablet with uh, in the same order as, as what they appeared in scripture. Uh, Pedinato says he never did that. Uh, in, in the December story, Pedinato said he was uh, was said to have stated that he had misread the cuneiform signs. Next, he stated the cities of the plains were not found on the same tablet, much less the same order as the Bible. He did, however, say that Sodom and Gomorrah were mentioned several times in these tablets. So that would still be something that would be positive for us. 
if it was true. However, later Matai and, and Archai discredited even that claim, uh, saying that there's no trace of any of these cities found in any of the, of the, uh, of the tablets, so that was all just a fabrication. Meanwhile, the remainder of the archaeological world was denied access to the tablets or pictures of the tablets or any other publication of the tablets. Everything was frozen at that period of time because there's so much uh, political um, turmoil because of them. And so publication of the tablets in question was placed in the 20 years to the future or possibly never category. They may never come to light. They may never be published. And certainly 20 years later, we still don't have a, a clear view of the tablets. A year later in December 1980, uh, the Biblical Archaeology Review posted a story by Pedinato. In response to an earlier article entitled New Ebla Epigrapher Attacks Conclusions of Aspen Scholar, where Archie in, in the 1980 uh, story prior to the, to the one that uh, Pedinato responds to, Archie said that a lot of the stuff that Pedinato said was, was false, and he, and he talked about how, how bad it was. So Pedinato fires back, and so the earlier article dealt with an interview with Archie who had replaced Pedinato. Challenged, uh, and so Pedinato challenges Archie's qualifications, saying he is an untenured professor in, hit, in, hit, in, hit, in Hittitology. Archie is neither a Sumerologist or an Assyriologist, a Semitist, nor a Semitist, a Semitist, nor a biblical scholar. I'm sorry, these words are unfamiliar to me. He is not a religious historian. And he is not an expert in ancient economies. So we find that Pedinato says that, that Archie has no qualifications whatsoever to be the epigrapher. He simply picked because he was going to play the, the political game accurately. Uh, I, I have every reason to believe that could be true. I've seen it happen so many times in the past, and it will probably happen in the future as well. So what are the matters of dispute that, uh, that Archie was saying that Pedinato had, mis had, made, had made a mistake about? Pedinato was trying to correct. He mentioned the appearance of, of the word Ya, Y-A, uh, in, our, in our English language, in several of the texts, which he took to be a divine name, probably very, very accurately a divine name. Connections were made with Yahweh, which would be our God, which he claims he did not make, but that he could have common background. He said that there, there was possibly a common background between Yah and Yahweh. He just didn't know for sure what it was. He mentioned anointing the head with oil as a practice shared by people in the Bible that he found in some of the tablets. Archie said it was not anointing the head with oil, but a reference to first quality oil. So the, the head oil had to be with first quality rather than, uh, than the, uh, the anointing of the head with oil, even though the rest of it seemed like it supported that, that text. He then defended his earlier statement that the tablets contained a creation poem as legitimate. Uh, so we have another uh, earlier, even earlier than the, the ones we've had before, a reference to a, to a creation poem. And... Uh, um, Pedinato said he had seen one in the, in the tablets. Archie said it was not, uh, it was not uh, a creation poem, but it was a confusing poem that might have been misunderstood to be a creation poem. Uh, so Pedinato says if he was confused by this because he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, Pedinato's translation of the creation event was like, as, uh, as follows. He says he found in the tablets, or in one of the tablets at least, or he actually said in several of the tablets, he found the, this poem, and, and when it was all put together, he found it this way. To the Lord of heaven and earth, you had not made the earth exist, you created it. You had not established the sun, you created it. You had not yet made the morning light exist. Lord, efficacious words. Lord, prosperity. Lord, heroism. Lord, something that was un undecipherable. Lord, independent. Lord, divinity. Lord, who saves. Lord, happy life. Now, all of this using the word Yah that he said was in the, in the, in the, uh, art, in the tablets. And all of that uh, be, being basically a, a translation of an early um, creation myth or creation uh, account. Uh, so we can see that that again, uh, early, early, early in the writings of mankind, uh, there there's there's stories that are shared of of, uh, of the creation that have similar ideas. But we've seen some of some of the later on Sumerian documents that, that had very similar words as this one in our earlier studies when we were looking at the creation myths. So how did Pedinato feel about Archie's work? He said Archie's entire article is permeated an effort to efface even the remotest relationship between Ebla and the Bible. So thorough is this effort that one must wonder if Archie's article was inspired by a love of scientific proof or by political motives. That's certainly what we would all be thinking about as well. Three years have passed since Archie was appointed by the mission director as a pigrapher to the Italian mission at Ebla. Fortunately, the results thus, are, thus far are nil. What he basically said was everything that Archie had done was, was bad, was not, was not accurate. Uh, he had no qualifications for the job. He was just simply doing what was politically uh, politically right for the times, as far as the Syrians were concerned, he had no actual uh, love for science or scientific proof. Uh, we've seen such stuff like that happen before. I have every reason to believe that it happened then, and I and I sort of I feel very sorry for Pedinato, who was discredited by Arki, who, who was basically trying to do a, a political snow job on the findings. Finally, we have in September 1980 uh, a, a 
uh, Herschel Shanks interview. Remember, the Herschel Shanks wrote one of the earlier stories concerning uh, the Abu Tablets. And he goes ahead and interviews Pettinato one more time. And he asks Pettinato if he, if he was retracting anything. Pettinato denied retracting anything. He said he could only re retract what he'd written, and he was not going to retract anything that he'd written. Uh, he said that many newspapers had claimed to interview him, which said they had never done so, so we had fake news back then as well. He said they made up much of the, what they had attributed to him, uh, that he never said half the stuff that they said that he said. And so they had made a lot of, uh, uh, um, I guess, uh, some, some mistakes and errors in what they were saying he said. He continued to support the existence of the name Sodom and Gomorrah in the tablets. He said to wait and see about the other three cities of the plains, such as Zebulim and Zohar and so on. Uh, so uh, I, I think that probably all of those, all those names did exist in the tablets, probably still do. But they've been sort of locked down, so we can't see them now. So nobody can prove that or not or disprove that. So as we look through this uh, this lesson, I have a few concluding thoughts, and that's that's this. Science will go to great lengths to silence anything that seems to support the Bible. A science doesn't want the Bible to be true most of the time, especially atheistic scientists doesn't want the Bible to be true. They'll go to great lengths to try to silence anything that seems to support the Bible. So will political interest who who are very interested in keeping the Bible suppressed at times. Some people will invent things to make themselves look good. Uh, so it's possible that Pettinato was trying to make himself look good. It's, it's sure uh, possible that, that uh, Arky was trying to make himself look good. Sometimes it's hard to know who's making up what. And, and, and if you don't have any experience in the, in, the, in the field, you have to just take what the media tells you with a grain of salt. Uh, our faith must be based upon the word of God, though. All that, all that science should be able to do is to add more evidence to our already existing faith. It should never be the basis of our faith. Uh, we just need to remember that as we're, as we're studying uh, science and looking at what science can contribute, even archaeology being a science, to look at what it can contribute to our understanding of the scripture, we need to realize that we are never, ever going to base our faith on, on these things. We're going to use these things to bolster our faith, possibly to, to encourage us even more, but we're never going to base our faith on that. Our faith comes from one source, and that's the, the final verse that I said I was going to include in this lesson, this last thought we're going to have tonight. Where does our faith come from, folks? Our faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. As we read the Bible and we understand the Bible, as we, as we look at Scripture, as we as we hold Scripture dear to our hearts, there's where our faith comes from, is from Scripture. Uh, what, the, what the science is going to either do is support that Scripture or, or detract from that Scripture. But so far, there's never been anything discovered that could absolutely detract from Scripture. Everything that's been found has either supported Scripture or been innocuous concerning Scripture. But there's nothing that's ever come to, to light that's, that's discredited the Scripture in any way that I can remember or see. Our faith comes from hearing from Jesus our Lord, not from Evelyn Stone, so they may support the Word. Or Pedinato or Archie or Matai. Our faith should be stronger than Syria or Israel or Menachem Begin or anybody else on the face of this earth that might might seek to, to discredit the, the scripture. So my, my warning to you is this, if, you, if you're using science to, to try to prove yourself right in concerning scripture, you're going to have a very difficult time doing so. If we're using it on the other hand just to help support our understanding of scripture, then that's, that's very possible. As we continue with uh, more modern finds here later on, uh, our finds that, that are more modern to, to the world, now we're going to find that that these things will help support scripture again and again if we just let, if we just will uh, learn about them and understand them. In the meantime, sometimes there there will be folks that will try to discredit the scripture. They'll do so with with all they have at their disposal. So be very cautious before you use science to prove or disprove the scripture. Instead, uh, let scripture stand on its own on its own merits. Uh, there's nothing untrue about scripture that I can ever find. Nothing that's that's false. Everything seems to be supported so far. Uh, I'm going to continue to believe that God sent the scripture to us that he gave it through uh, men who spoke from him and spoke his exact words that it's inspired in all of its ways. That's what I'm going to believe about scripture, and I hope that you will too. As I close this lesson tonight, I want to give an invitation, as I always do. If you're, if you're with us tonight and you're listening online and, and you need to be baptized, please let us know either by calling one of the elders or calling myself and, and, uh, or, or, or sending a, a text to us one way or whatever, whatever, whatever way you can find to let us know. Let us know that you want to be baptized, and we'll sit down with you and, and work through this and, and make sure you get baptized so you'll be saved. If you need the prayers of the church, if there's any way we can help, help you or serve you, let us know that as well as we, as we end this lesson and go to, this, to the final songs. Thank you for your time.